Thank you, Raleigh, for inviting me to be a member of the committee and to uh, make this presentation. Us earth side geologists have come to this party a little bit late, but we have an opportunity here to develop a U.S. plan, which is going to be more oriented to geology than the previous one. Um, the Indian Ocean really is a smorgasbord for geochemists and geologists interested in everything from plate tectonics to mantle evolution. We look at it and we see a host of features that are of extraordinary interest. Oops, excuse me. Come back here. Come back here. Okay. Uh, ranging from oceanic plateaus like Kerguelen, um, we have hotspot tracks, we have strange hooked ridges, we have a wonderful panoply, the Nye East Ridge, an incredibly varied ocean ridge system um, that offers a remarkable opportunity to understand the geologic processes and mantle evolution. And for example, over here, we have the Rodriguez or the Indian Ocean Triple Junction. Down here at the other end, the Bouvet Triple Junction. And you can see by these stripes uh, that there's tremendous variation in the rate of spreading along these ridges. We have an ultra-slow spreading ridge here, which has its own unique tectonics. We have a ridge here, which is spreading at many times that rate, and an intermediate rate ridge up here. So it's an opportunity to look at ocean ridges in one basin that are representing a wide variety of spreading rates to examine how that influences the evolution of the ocean crust and its formation. Now, I'm going to mostly concentrate on this one, the ultra-slow spreading ridges, because this is where really new opportunities have arisen to understand metal evolution uh, and the evolution of the ocean crust and uh, plate tectonics lies. Um, the other thing about the uh, Indian Ocean uh, down here in the southwest Indian Ridge is that you have a numerous mantle hotspots, Reunion, Gulf, uh, Spice Seam Out right now is the present location of the Bouvet hotspot, Marion Island, Crozet, Reunion. These are all active volcanic islands. And so this is a remarkable place to try and understand deeper mantle circulation. So we have our hotspot tracks that we get enthusiastic about that lead to oceanic plateaus, um, where we had large volcanic events from 90 to 94 million years, and then a trail that leads up to the ridge. And it's an ideal place to study the interactions between plumes and ridges in the oceans. There is a fundamental boundary here of significant importance. This is the boundary between the uh, east and west Gondwana following breakup. And this is the Andrew Bain fracture zone. Oops, excuse me. Not my favorite. Um, and it is a mega shear that has been active since about 650 million years ago. Continuously active feature. It originally started as uh, a boundary, a convergent plate boundary between uh, formed during the collapse of the Mozambique Ocean, which was once the size of the Pacific. That ocean disappeared down into nowhere, leaving behind this belt of crumpled island arcs and back arcs and uh, old uh, subduction zone mantle wedges. And then when the Gondwana split up, um, east and west Gondwana split up along, I'm trying to get, along the uh, margin between the orogenic belt that was formed by this closure um, and then nucleated this great big shear, mega shear, called the uh, Andrew Brain Fracture Zone, which is the second largest transcurrent fault on Earth. And it divides the uh, whole southern Indian Ocean into very distinct geochemical process, provinces. One of the things that's most intriguing about the Indian Ocean, however, is mantle plumes have played a big role in geology. They're kind of the go-to thing to explain whatever you can explain in volcanism. And when it comes to ocean ridges, on-axis plumes and off-axis plumes are believed by many to feed hot, fertile mantle, upwelling mantle to a ridge, and this creates an elevated ridge axis. And so these are called ocean rises, and they may be uh, distal to the uh, actual hot spot, or they may be hot spots centered as in Iceland. That origin, however, has been thrown into question by what we see on the um, 
southwest Indian Ridge. Here we have rifted rises and we have axial rises. What's the difference? The difference is, is that an axial rise has a thick crust and is greatly elevated. The rifted rises with a deep rift basin, that topology bespeaks a very low magma budget, which is in conflict with the common explanation for ocean rises. And one of the things is when we look at the basalt chemistry, we can see that as you go to the rifted rises, you get far more sodic basalts. This implies a very low degree of metal melting and very low melt production. And this flies in the face, these rifted rises, the Azores rise and the Marion rise, of that model that I just previously showed you. Now, that can be explained, this variation can be explained from the variation of going from cold to hot mantle. It can also be explained from going from a depleted mantle, depleted by an earlier melting event, to a fertile mantle. And this is a great ambiguity that needs to be resolved in understanding deep mantle circulation. The Southwest Indian Ridge has the largest abundance of exposed mantle rock anywhere on Earth. About 25% of the seafloor presently being generated on the Southwest Indian Ridge is mantle, lithosphere with no crust. It's a major change in our paradigms for undercrustal structure. This has large implications potentially for carbon sequestration, the global carbon cycle, and for, uh, uh, for the existence of life. We believe that this um, serpentization by which mantle peritite is altered produces methane. And if there's extensive serpentization in the Indian Ocean, we may have a major biological province that we haven't evaluated. Moreover, as I will point out later on, is it's very likely that there's a large zone of serpentine underlying the ocean crust in this region where there is crust where there may be a whole new biosphere that we have never reported, that's never been reported on. The um, ultra-slow spreading has absolutely unique tectonics, as I'll mention in a minute, um, with a new form of plate boundary that has only been known for the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, it has the largest axial of volcanoes overall of any ocean ridge. And extreme ridge obliquity creates unusual thermal environments. The densest ar array of transfer of any ocean ridge, basically because it's sitting here at a 45 degree angle to the, to the plate spraying direction. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the oldest continuously active structures on Earth. This is the Andrew Bain fracture, fracture zone. Um, here's something that's really kind of startling. Here's your classic mid-ocean ridge crustal section. Everybody agreed on it. You know, it's in all your textbooks. Six to seven kilometers of nice thick crust coming out of the mantle. Overlying, by, overlying a mantle tectonite. Well, the southwest Indian Ridge, this is the result of a couple hundred dredge holes, and it shows you what we recovered. Most of the dredging has happened right on the neovolcanic zone of the Mid-Ocean Ridge, and so naturally you recover basalt. But when we go off axis, we see vast quantities of mantle peridotite, as you can see here. But what we don't see is much gabbro. This means that what people think of as geologic layer three, seismic layer three, is missing in large portions of the Indian Ocean in the Southwest Indian Ridge. And therefore, crustal structure isn't what we think it is. Here we have another uh, intriguing factor of the Southwest Indian Ridge, is mantle geochemists spent a great deal of time studying isotopes and trying to figure out the sources of mid-ocean ridge basalts and mantle evolution. On the Indian Ocean, you have extraordinary large-scale variations in isotopic composition, which I'm illustrating here not by a full diagram along the ocean ridges, but just in one simple area to show you the local variability, but along this, these two short ridge segments and another short ridge segment offset by a transform. The red dots, of course, lie way off in here towards EM1, the classic mantle source, others up near DMM, and there's no connection. It's, there's no simple gradients here. You're looking at a very heterogeneous mantle. How did that originate? What's going on? These differences are often masked with faster spraying ridges where higher degrees of mantle melting in a hotter mantle produce an averaged out composition for basalts erupting on the seafloor. So you can see things here in the mantle, in the, in the rocks that you can't see other places. This is the kind of thing we think now about ocean crustal structure, largely as a function 
A lot of it is because of what's happened on the Southwest Indian Ridge. These are all models here that have been verified by ocean drilling or by direct observation. And these completely amagmatic segments. Huge variability. This is not the model that you got in your geology textbooks. Now, this is really one of the big surprises that we discovered. These are amagmatic accretionary segments. The seafloor is just split and open, and you're pulling the mantle onto the seafloor with only scattered volcanics. And they take any orientation to this, man, to this plate spreading direction. You're spraying north-south here. Look to the north. You have this unusual cratered terrain of a plateau. To the south, huge mantle wedges coming up, one after the other to the south. This is not your mother's geology for Indian Ocean, for any ocean. This is a whole new form of spreading, a whole new form of plate boundary, and these can give rise to curvy linear plate boundaries. So they're probably the paradigm for early uh, non-volcanic rift and margins. Why is it so unusual? Well, here's a, a seismic study by Vera Schlindwin of that amagmatic center. And as you see here, she finds deeper earthquakes than anywhere else that they've looked at. Normally, you don't see many micro-earthquakes below 10 kilometers. But here, hugely deep. Now, here's another one in the same ridge. Interestingly enough, this is sitting right next to an amagmatic ridge segment that's flooding a mantle over the seafloor for the last six million years in this area here. Those are the green dots. Over here is the thickest piece of ocean crust found on the entire southwest Indian ridge. And it's really far from any mantle hotspot, 1,000 kilometers from Crozet. And here's the seismic section, enormously thick crust, and then a short distance away, a magmatic spreading. It's wild. Well, those are the mantle, mantle areas. Why is this so wild is because if you look, about, look at mantle melting, here is a plot of the depth versus melt fraction below an ocean ridge for various spreading rates. And you can see as you go from 5 millimeters a year to 20 millimeters a year, you have a huge change in the proportions of melt. But above 20 millimeters a year, it doesn't change that much. It's really small. So most ocean ridges melt out and produce a similar crust, like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge over large areas, East Pacific Rise, the Central Indian Ridge, um, the Southeast Indian Ridge. But this huge variability means that you perturb the plate tectonics and here we have a place where the ridge goes oblique, and all of a sudden you have a longer ridge producing the same volume of crust as, this, as a shorter wrist here. That can really perturb what's going on. And here we get giant seamounts, like Joseph May's seamount, and in between we get amagmatic segments, whereas over here we have linked smaller volcanoes closely spaced. It has something to do with the zone of contribution. That one out there is actually an alkaline volcano. It's got lavas just like Hawaii. What the hell is that doing there? It has something to do with very low degrees of mantle melting induced by the obliquity at very slow spring rates. Something that people think about a lot is Gondwana and the breakup of supercontinents. And they spent a lot of time thinking about um, reconstructing plates by piecing the geology back and forth across boundaries. But what's interesting here is this is also the process by which you create the Central Indian Ridge and the Southwest Indian Ridge and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And there aren't really many uh, convergent boundaries here. They're all passive margins. And we're really looking at an ocean basin where the mantle has been pulled out from underneath Gondwana. And what we see here is a classical geologist, and he's sitting on a noon attack in the middle of this vast field of ice. And this is the end of the stop in granite, 3.1 giga years. It's cut by the 179 Ferrar basalt, which is part of the Karoo sequence. And you can match these to coeval South African Karoo basalts initiated at the time of the breakup of Gondwana, and to the coeval to the uh, Archean Catwall Craton. So people tried desperately hard to map uh, different continental fragments. But the thing to think about here. And what's really intriguing me right now is the fact that the mantle that is currently coming up in the Indian Ocean has been pulled out from beneath Gondwana in, uh, 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 during the split breakup. So the question really arises is what can we see today that might tell us that this panoply of rocks 
And there are geochemical variations. Yellow is gabbro, red is, is basalt, green is peridotite. Is there anything here that reflects the geology of Gondwana and the Gondwanan mantle? This spot right here, Marion Island, is that spot right there. It's kind of the nexus for everything that happened in the breakup of Gondwana in the Indian Ocean. And the barrier here is a profound break in the geochemistry. Here is major elements. Normally, the isotope people get to play this game, but I can tell you that these are, this boundary here is also a profound break in isotopic geochemistry. And it is a break in mantle geochemistry, sorry, major element geochemistry. So that we look at mantle rocks as an indicator of degree of melting, and we have mantle here, which is depleted, mantle here, which is fertile, and we see this huge break here and an abrupt change in major element geochemistry. This is also reflected in the isotopes directly. And it's reflected in the bathymetry of the ridge. You've got an incredible correlation between the bathymetry of the ridge and the composition of mid-ocean ridge basalts and the composition of residual peridotites spatially associated. Now, most people have attributed that to simply varying degrees of melting by having different fundamental uh, mantle temperatures. So beneath the Iceland, for example, they think the mantle is very hot and far from Iceland, very cold. And so that will change where you enter this diagram and the amount of melt you produce. However, you can do the same thing by changing the composition of the mantle. Here we have a mantle peridotite that's much more depleted, and when you melt that, you produce a lot less melt. So Variations in, crustal th in, in ridge topography can reflect changes in mantle composition as well as mantle temperature. So uh, if you have very depleted mantle, what is one of the consequences? Well, there's a big de consequence for density. And here we see density for mantle xenoliths from all over the place. Spinel facies, spinel peridotites, garnet facies, garnet peridotites. Why do you care what the difference is? These are high alumina peridotites. And below the uh, depth, where, down at the depth where the garnet becomes stable, these peridotites are far more dense than spinel peridotites. Now, we have here a little reconstruction of Gondwana. And this here is the convergent belt. Uh, where East Gondwana and West Gondwana collided. It consists of old island arc fragments, marginal basin fragments, but what's missing, what's missing is the Mozambique Ocean itself, once the size of the Pacific or greater. And that seems to have disappeared. If we look at this now in terms of a little bit more geophysics, what we see is here is our big break which separated, that's this feature here, the western boundary of this um, East African orogenic belt, or East African Antarctic orogenic belt, which nucleated this transform. That is Marion. This is the big geochemical break. These red arrows are the mantle anisotropy-derived plate flow for 300 kilometers. And you can literally follow this down, and you can see that the mantle provinces over here all the west, eastern, southwest Indian Ridge is coming out from underneath the fragments of the old Neoproterozoic belt. You can also track where um, the hotspots are coming from. So there's Marion skirting the hotspot, skirting here. Here is uh, Bouvet coming out from here. You can actually look at this, and you can construct tectonic mantle provinces. And here I have Cartonia orogenia, and Syria. And you can take these and then subdivide them on the basis of their topologies and their, uh, and, their, and their ridge forms, and you come up with different little tectonic provinces. And interestingly enough, there is a one-to-one -one matchup to the changes in the geochemistry. So that brings me to the end, which is a race through the Indian Ocean. But the point is, is that that's key is the Indian Ocean is different than the Pacific. I'm wearing my Peter Lonsdale shirt. Now, those of you who know Peter Lonsdale know he wears the most outrageous Hawaiian shirts anyone has ever seen, 
and he has about four of them, and he used to wear them to work here every day. He's a major guy in plate tectonics. Came to Woods Hole and gave a talk about how boring slow sprain ridges were compared to fast sprain ridges. But the fast sprain ridge has uh, destructive subduction zones all the way around it. You're not looking at mantle pulled up from deep in the earth. You're looking at just recycling in one system. Here we see huge variabilities that's reflecting mantle evolution and history back for nearly a billion years. And you can track what's going on in the mantle by looking at these ridges and their geochemistry and how it varies and reconstruct mantle evolution and circulation for the last 650 million years. Thank you. <laughs>